How is everyone doing? Good. You're hanging in? Good, good, good. Well, I am delighted, truly delighted and excited to share today's message with you. Um, we know, I know that there's several traveling on the road and might be tuning in either via um, our live feed or uh, podcast later. And so we welcome you and are praying for your journeys this week and today. <sighs> Has anyone had a busy week? Anyone? Busy weeks? Boring weeks? Any boring weeks out there? No? Just, okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I heard it. If so, uh, Andrea will trade you if you had a boring week. Um, I might have, uh, trade you for some boring moments in there, too. Um, anyone deal with any stress this week? Okay. <laughs> hands all over the place. Okay. And if your hand's not raised, I'm thinking at some point you probably had encountered a little bit of stress. Well, we are in this series called Peace of Mind, and last week we began this series. Uh, we talked about two myths surrounding mental health. Um, basically, that Christians shouldn't struggle with their mental health, that, that, that God doesn't care about your mental health, and we debunked those myths. And we said we were going to be on a journey over the next few weeks addressing different areas of mental health issues. And um, first of all, we're going to get God's word in our hands. So if you have God's word, if you, paper, digital, however you have it, there are Bibles and seats in front of you. Get it out at this time. Raise it up in the air. Say, I got my Bible, PK. Awesome, awesome. I love that. That's like one of the highlights of my week is looking and seeing all the Bibles in the air. I think it's great. Uh, we're going to spend some time in here, and we're not going to read the entirety of the main passage we'll be parking in today, but if you want to turn to Second Chronicles um, chapter 20, we will be in that story. And I encourage you to read the entirety of that text at some point during the week. It is just an amazing, amazing story, and we'll be kind of summarizing and brief those parts. But I wanted to start off this morning sharing about my, my very first panic attack. That sounds fun, right? Sharing about my first panic attack. Well, when I was newly married, um, we got married right out of college at Pastor John and myself, and we, we moved up to Michigan. We got our first apartment, and, and we were newlyweds, and I was away from my home home and away from my college home, and, and I was searching for a job. It was maybe nine months I was searching for a job. It took forever, and I thought for sure, college grad, I'm going to just be a shoe in and it just took forever. And I remember a certain point being in a parking lot space, holding my chest, my heart racing, my chest hurting, and trying to catch my breath and going, what on earth is happening? Am I having a heart attack? I, I don't understand what is going on. And, and I was so panicked. I had no clue what I was doing. And, and, and it continued. I would drive from do this thing called driving that I got used to, kind of like riding a bike, right? For years, I drive from point A to point B, and in the middle of driving, just at random times, I get this moment, <gasps> and I'd have to find a place to pull over to try and calm down because I didn't feel safe driving on the road. And I was like, what in the world is going on with me? And, and you know, I'm glad that I was one of those that I wasn't, at that time, I knew that I needed help. Remember last week we talked about how getting help is a sign of wisdom. It's not a, it's not a sign of weakness. It's, it's wisdom to get help. And so I'm glad that I knew that as a young adult. And so I sought out a Christian psychologist. And I said, hey, you know, this is happening and I don't know what's going on. I don't know if there's some kind of chemical imb imbalance in my brain. I don't know what's happening. And so she took me through a series of different tests to figure out what was going on. And she said, you're just, life is coming at you fast. All of these changes, and some people, they respond to this with a physical reaction, such as an anxiety or panic attack. And so probably once you get settled in, settled down, you'll probably have less and less, or they'll be less and less intense. But in the meantime, here's some Bible verses to fix your eyes on Jesus, to meditate on, and here's how you can breathe and push through the moments of panic, and you're good to pull off the side of the road if it happens while you're driving, and so on. And so I did that. I went and I did my homework. I, I practiced the Bible verses. I practiced the breathing, and eventually life did settle in, and they got less and less and less and less intense. And so I was thankful 
But most of us know, <laughs> rarely life feels settled for long, right? <laughs> I've had many, many moves in my life. I had many, many changes in my life. I've had medical issues in my life. I've had a child uh, who is a beautiful blessing, but at the moment there were some things afterwards that I that physically went through that brought on uh, change and difficulty physically. Um, there was COVID. There was um, even with like P Pastor John PJ being on sabbatical and going off grid and like he has no internet, no connection to his phone how can I read ah, 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 ah. like initially I was panicked right I'm like oh my goodness okay God uh, he's yours you got on this journey you've got him you got him you got him you got him you got him ah. when we get overwhelmed we can feel panic and, and you know I feel embarrassed sometimes here I'm sharing all this with you it's the reality of my life I feel embarrassed sometimes and even ashamed as a Christian as a pastor, I feel like I should have it more together and shouldn't have these moments of intense anxiety in my life where I physically respond in the way that I do. In moments of my life, I've been told or asked, well, aren't you praying about it? If you're praying about it, you shouldn't be having these. Well, of course I'm praying about it. Absolutely. But then it made me think a question, am I praying wrong? Am I doing something wrong in my prayer life where I, I, I'm not getting it quite yet? And then yet, on the other hand, I'm so thankful that I have friends that I can call on that understand that I love God, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, and I'm praying about it, but that I'm also human, and they stand in the gap, and they go to battle and prayer and fight alongside of me. But unfortunately, some people, some Christians, they don't or traditionally haven't understood struggles with anxiety. They should just give it to God. They should just pray about it, and they shouldn't be bothered by stress. After all, isn't that what God's word says? Uh, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, don't be anxious about anything. Have you ever been frustrated when you've heard those verses or maybe ashamed? Don't be anxious about anything? Really? Is it possible? To not be anxious in the world that we live in. Any of you feel that way? Have that question? How can you not feel stressed from constant bills, kids to raise, mouths to feed, them going back to school, relational issues, health challenges, job stress, inflation? Has anyone seen the price of a gallon of milk? A gallon of gas? Oh, right? It's not... It, it doesn't seem possible to not be anxious in the world that we live in. You open up and watch a news app or you watch the news and the world is falling apart and nobody likes each other. <laughs> if you ever feel like you're battling with anxiety and you feel like there's plenty to be stressed or anxious about, you are not alone. In fact, according to a study done in 2019, this has been a few years. Two out of three Americans said they were anxious or extremely anxious. That was in 2019. Since the pandemic, the numbers have only gotten worse, and the frequency and intensity of people dealing with anxiety is hitting record levels. It's skyrocketing, and especially for younger generations. In fact, 91 in a recent study, 91% uh, of high school and college students report consistent, we've got some yup in the back, consistent and significant levels of anxiety associated with stress. 91%, nine out of 10 young people that you see are dealing with intense anxiety. Anxiety is perhaps one of the most common mental health issues of the day and that's why we want to talk about it that's why we want to address it this morning it's a incredibly complex subject again i'll repeat i'm not an expert i'm not a doctor i'm not a psychologist i am a pastor and in many cases for some of you i would advise you know maybe you need to seek the great physician but you also might need to get some expert help as well and so today i'm going to talk about this and address it from a spiritual standpoint Anxiety is different for everyone. There's kind of like an anxiety spectrum, if you will. On one end, you have uh, maybe some um, occasional minor bouts of stress or anxiety. 
maybe if you're a student, you have a test coming, you get really nervous about it and then the test and it passes. Maybe there's a presentation at work that you have to give and you get, get kind of nervous about that. Maybe you're going into a social situation that's kind of awkward for you and you're really nervous to go because I just, I'm not real comfortable. I don't know these people. There's that side. And then on the other end of the spectrum, anxiety can be crushing absolutely debilitating. It can, um, you can get a sense of dread, a shortness of breath. Your chest can hurt. You feel like the walls are closing in on you. You feel like you can't breathe and you can't function. And wherever you're at on this spectrum, we, I want you to know that the feelings that you have are valid. They're valid. But I also want to share with you that God cares about you and how you feel, and he wants to help you, and there's help available. And that's why this week's title is Heal My Anxious Mind. So let's pray. God, we ask that your presence would do a healing work in our lives, that you would renew our minds. God, teach us your word today by your presence and your power, and we ask for this healing. We ask for this renewing of our mind that we would fix our eyes on you. And we ask for your goodness and we ask for peace of mind. And we believe that you'll hear our prayers and change our minds and our hearts with your comfort, your presence, and your peace. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, today we're going to look at a powerful example in Second um, Chronicles um, that was dealing with anxiety. We're going to look at one of the best kings there is. Um, there were some good ones, and then there were some not so good ones. But today we're going to look at one of the good kings. We're going to look at Jehoshaphat. He was the fourth king of Judah in the southern kingdom of Israel. And in 2 Chronicles 20, we read, if you read the story in full, we read that Judah was about to be under attack. And if you can imagine, this is a godly kingdom uh, a godly king leading a good kingdom, and all of a sudden its leader, Jehoshaphat, is facing an enemy, the Moabites. But not just one enemy, but a group, a gang of enemies are joining forces with the Moabites. We have the Moabites, we have the Ammonites, and we have the Munites, making three different groups joining forces at one time that were getting to attack this kingdom. Can you imagine this intense and stressful situation to be facing as king, as leader of this people? Just like Jehoshaphat, we might be able to handle one enemy in our lives. We might be able to handle one difficult boss. But when you add to that difficult boss a car that breaks down, um, <laughs> financial issues, um, which the financial issues that create more stress in an already stressful marriage, and then you decide to start a diet, and then you go into work, and the very first day of your diet, someone brings in donuts. <laughs> right? It, that's just way too much to handle. That's a lot of enemy forces coming your way all at once. We referenced earlier um, the younger generation, whom I love and I'm spending a lot of time with these days. What's fascinating is that it's being said that this generation is the most anxious generation to be out there. One article said, it's because they're the most educated with the least clear path to what they would call success. So what you have is an overeducated, underemployed group of people that feel like they're falling behind with inflation going bonkers, going crazy. They can't buy a home, so they postpone buying a home. Uh, they feel like they can't get married, so they postpone marriage. And they're feeling further and further and further behind in life. And how in the world are they ever going to catch up? How are they ever going to meet what they have in their mind as success or just survival? Even our children are overwhelmed with anxiety. And that's in part why the Lord, I believe, led us to do youth group, how we're going to do it starting this week, um, where we're going to take an hour in the middle of the week, in, in, in the middle of our chaos and the pressure, and we're going to pause, we're going to breathe, we're going to encourage each other, we're going to be present, and we're going to be encouraged in the Lord and just have that freedom just to stop, <laughs> to stop the pressure 
and to be encouraged together. Um, yeah. So, to make matters worse, <laughs> sorry, uh, there are well-meaning Christians, like I've re referenced before, um, who tell us that you shouldn't feel anxious. Um, once you give your life to Jesus, you should be full of peace and joy. And, and, we, and when you hear these things, when you think these things, you often start to feel guilty for the anxiety and you feel like you must be doing something wrong and you don't have a safe place to go to talk about it. And, and that compounds your anxiety and then you end up not knowing really what to do or how to handle it. And the first thing that I want to share from the church, from our church this morning is, is anxiety is not a sin. Anxiety is not a sin. In fact, look at the life of Jesus. Look at when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was going to um, give his life on the cross and go through incredible suffering. He's kneeling in the garden, begging God, God, is there any other way? Can you please take this cup from me? I, I really, I know what's coming. I really, really don't want to go through with, with it, this deep, anguishing, agony that Jesus went through, this anxiety, this stress, so much stress that he is sweat, literal drops of blood as he submitted to the will of God. He said, not my will, I, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, but may your will, God, be done in my life. Jesus went through anxiety. <laughs> anxiety is not a sin, it, it's a it's actually a symptom, excuse, excuse me, a symptom or a signal. Anxiety is not a sin. It's a signal. It's kind of like when our little red engine light comes on our dashboard. <laughs> and we go, oh, no, what's going on? Your car hasn't necessarily done something wrong yet, right? Hopefully not. Hopefully you haven't ignored that little sucker and something is now wrong. But, um, you know, it's a signal indicating that there's something wrong with the car. It's a symptom of an issue that needs to be discovered and figured out and fixed, right? So what do you do? You don't throw out the car for having that little signal pop up. No, that would be silly, right, to junk it? Instead, you take the car to the mechanic so the mechanic can fix the car. In the same way, if you find yourself battling with anxiety, this isn't a sin. It's a signal alerting you to do three things. Anxiety from a spiritual perspective is a signal alerting you that, number one, it's time to pray. It's time to pray. And I love this message because it's so practical. I, I believe that for those of us that deal with stress and anxiety, you're going to take home these three next things that are signals of what to do, and you're going to start applying them, and your life is going to start to change. That's how much I believe in this message this morning. And the first thing it is, when you have anxiety, it's a signal that it's time to stop and pray. And this is exactly what Jehoshaphat did in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3. Here he is with three enemies ready to attack, and this is what happens. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. Jehoshaphat was, was terrified. Another version says he was alarmed. He was anxious by this news. We're being attacked on three sides, and so... He stopped and he took it as a signal to pray, to bring his burden to God. And he begged the Lord for guidance. He says, God, show me what to do. And he ordered everyone else in Judah to start fasting. Anxiety isn't a sin. It's a signal telling you to turn to God. It's time to pray. And then let me show you Jehoshaphat's prayer. It's a powerful prayer that he starts praying in verse 6. He says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. Watch his faith in verse 9. If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. 
God, we trust you. Our faith is in you. We call on you, God, and we believe that you will save us. You can pray like that, you know, when you feel anxious, when you feel the stress coming, when you feel overwhelmed, you don't know what to do. You take the signal of anxiety and you can cry out to God like that. You could be fancy and say, oh, God, the Lord of our ancestors. You could do that. Or you could do what I do and go, God, help. <laughs> help, help me. I, I just don't, I don't know what to do. I really need, I, I need to know what direction to go. I, I'm struggling here. I, I'm freaking out. I don't know where to turn. I'm overwhelmed. Why is this happening, God? I don't understand. Please make clear what direction, what answer I need to give or where I need to turn to, God. You could just cry out to God. You could be brutally honest with him and have faith that he'll hear the cries of your heart and he will save you because he will. Anxiety isn't a sin. It's a signal telling you to turn to God. It's time to pray. I want to share some research done by um, a doctor, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, author of the book Switch on Your Brain. I'm going to read her um, little uh, biography. Hold on one moment. I have to really read this here. <clears throat> Dr. Carolyn, she's, she's a communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist with a master and PhD in communication pathology and a BS in logopiatics, specializing in cognitive and metacognitive neurology. Right? Super impressive. I have no idea what most of that means. I don't have a clue, but it's pretty impressive. I think she's smart. I know she's smart. And in her research, here's what she discovered. She discovered the following. It has been found that 12 minutes, only 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can actually be measured on a brain scan. Let me repeat that. 12 minutes of day, daily prayer, Focus prayer over an eight-week period can change your brain so much that it can be measured on a brain scan. Not only does prayer touch the heart of God, but prayer changes the chemistry of your brain. I love the science of it because this is it, it, super exciting because our brain, as we mentioned last week, is not fixed. It's actually static. It, it grows. It's dynamic. Or it's not static. It, 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 it's growing. It's dynamic, which is good news because sometimes uh, my brain goes wrong places and it likes to just stay and hang out there. Um, but we live in an era where science has shown us that the brain can change and we can actually direct and change our brain. <laughs> The fancy term is neuroplasticity, and as we talked about last week, the more you think a thought, the more you ruminate and chew on it, the more it's easier to think of that thought. And, and because you're creating these neural pathways in your brain, these patterns that God designed, and, and what he can do is he can renew and change your brain with his word as you focus on it. And literally prayer can not only just touch the heart of God, but by ruminating, by, by meditating on his word, it can actually change the chemistry of the brain. You know, God is fascinating about and how he created the brain. He gave us the amygdala, which is this little almond-shaped thing that is there for our good in our brain. When something goes wrong, our, that little part of our brain sends off an alarm. Alarm, 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 alarm. This happened when I was on sabbatical and I was hiking in bear country. I'm walking along the path in my world, talking to Jesus, and I hear rustle, 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 this little rustling sound, rustle, 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 and I'm going, <gasps> now do I think, oh, it's just a cute little bunny rabbit just hopping along, coming to see me. No, the amygdala sends off this like, oh man, oh, it might be a bear, it might be a boar, it might be Bigfoot coming to get me. Oh man, I better start talking loudly to myself. I better start ringing that bear bell like crazy, right? <laughs> That's the amygdala doing its job that God created it to do. But the problem is, is when we start to dwell on that alarm, when we start to fix ourselves and our thoughts on that alarm. The word in scripture most often translated as anxiety is the word merino, which is to dwell or ponder on fearful 
or anxious thoughts. It literally is an image of meditating on the negative. In other words, some of us, we're training our brains to become anxious. We really are. We're rehearsing anxious thoughts, and, you know, we think about something, and we go, oh, man, and and then this could go wrong, and, ooh, and if I do that, that could go wrong, and then if I do that, and then that could happen, and, oh, and we're training the neural pathways in our brain to focus on the negative. And it may be natural to think about what could go wrong, but prayer is not natural. Prayer is supernatural. And while it may be natural to think about what could go wrong, supernatural prayer breaks the cycle. That's why it's a signal to pray. It takes our mind off of what we are afraid of, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Prayer breaks the cycle. It doesn't just touch the heart of God. It changes your brain. Anxiety is not a sin. You're normal if you feel anxious, but it's a signal to take it to God in prayer. And this is what Jehoshaphat did. Oh, Lord, God of heaven, are you not with us? So hear the cries of our heart and you will save us. Now watch how honest he is next. And in verse 12, Sorry, I thought I had a slide for it. In verse 12, if you look in the Bible, it says, he says, for we have no power to fa- face this vast army that's attacking us. We have no power. Do you ever feel like that? Like there's just too much coming at me all at, mon- all at once. It's too much for me. I can't handle it all. I can't get it all done. I don't have what it takes. I don't know if I can go on. Jehoshaphat continues to say in 12, we, we don't know what to do. I don't have what it takes I am not strong enough. And he says in verse 12, but my eyes are on you, God. My eyes are on you, God. I'm always looking to you. I'm desperate for you. I need you, God. I'm training my mind to think about you. I'm not believing the lies of the enemy. I'm renewing my mind with truth. And what truth? The truth of your character, God, your goodness, your nature, your righteousness, your power. I'm choosing to believe that you're for me and not against me. I'm choosing to believe by faith that you're working in all things, the very things that I do not want, that you're bringing about good because I love you and I know that I'm called according to your purpose. I don't know what to do. There's too much. I can't handle it all. I'm freaking out. I can't hold it together. I don't know where to turn. No human being can handle this. Right. Exactly the point. You weren't designed to handle it on your own. Anxiety is not a sin. It's a symptom. It's a signal that you need God and that you need to talk to him. It's a signal to pray. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Peter, former fisherman of fish, now fisherman of men, writes this and he uses the fishing term cast. Casting your anxiety onto God goes like this in your prayers as an example. God, I don't understand it. I'm hurting. I'm desperate. I feel anxious. My heart rate's rising. I'm sweating. I'm freaking out about my kids. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how you're going to make this money situation work. I'm not sure how to deal with all the tension that I feel in the world. I don't know what I'm going to do, but here it is, God. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. God cares And you cast your cares because he cares for you. In other words, if it's on your mind, it's on his heart. If it's big enough for you to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Anxiety is not a sin, it's a signal alerting you to pray. It's time to take it to God and pray. So you pray. And then what do you do? Do you jump in and you take control? I mean... I do that sometimes, like, God, you're taking too long to figure out the situation that's stressing me out, so I'm just going to take control. Oh, yeah. Right? No, that's not what we do. Anxiety is a signal alerting you. It's time to pray, and it's time to pause. It's time to pause. Jehoshaphat did this after his prayer. He says in verses 12 through 13, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. 
Now, naturally, I don't get this. The enemies are pressing in on every side, and they just stand there. I would think that, you know, now's the time for action, to do something, because I'm a doer. I'm a person of action. Personally, I would be, if I was there, I'd be like, Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat, don't just stand there. Do something. They're attacking, right? But sometimes God says, don't just do something. Stand there. Don't just do something. Stand there. There are times when God will tell you to be still. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I don't know what to do. God, I, I don't have the power, but my eyes are on you. I'm going to be still and know that you care for me and that you love me and that you see me. Pausing isn't really natural, though, in our Western go, go, go culture, is it? Well, sometimes we don't even know how to pause or when to do it. I want to give you a practical tool. If you have a smartphone this morning, this tool has been absolutely amazing in my life over the past few months. It's called the One Minute Pause app. And you can download this app onto your phone and it will schedule moments in your day. Will it or interrupt? It'll bring up a notification to say it's time to pause. And you go through a, it's a app designed by John Eldridge, if you're familiar with that author and Christian psychologist. Um, it's an app designed by him based off of a couple of books he has written. And it'll interrupt your day and you can choose a one, one minute, three minute, five minute, 10 minute pause. And it leads you through a, a meditation on scripture. It instructs you to breathe. Sometimes I know I'm breathing, but I'm not really breathing. And it instructs you to do that. And it instructs you to just give everything and, and everyone in your life that you're stressing about in that moment, that you're thinking about, that you're anxious about, to give it over to God. It is a practical tool, a practical way that you can pause in your day and focus on the Lord. So I'd encourage you to check that out as a practical way to pause. Okay, so we pray and we do nothing. We pause and then God heals us of our anxiety. Well, sometimes, sometimes he can, he, he does. And then sometimes it's more of a process. Either way is okay. God works in different ways with different people in different levels of anxiety. Um, the process might look like Bible verses that you start to rehearse and that start to renew your mind. It might be a diet change so that your body chemistry works better. It might be when you go see a expert, they might say, you know, you really need a prescription to normalize the chemical imbalances in your brain. You might need some therapy um, in order to name, face, forgive, and heal from trauma in your life. You might need to retrain your brain with cognitive behavior therapy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. God has everyone on a different journey with this. Sometimes it is instant, and sometimes it's a process, but it always starts with God, is directed by him, and is a result of God. So you pause and you take it to him. And so... While Jehoshaphat and the people waited, the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel and said the following in verse 15 and 17. It's up on the screen. Jehaziel says, Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. In other words, don't be afraid. The battle is the Lord's. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need to only what? Be still. It's this promise that God is with you. He's for you. He loves you. He cares about you. His power is real and available to you. He will never leave you or forsake you. <clears throat> Anxiety is not a sin. It's a signal. It's, it's alerting you that it's time to pray and that it's time to pause. And it's also time to praise. It's a time to thank him for who he is. Jehoshaphat, he prayed, God, we believe you. Even if we face calamity in the worst of situations, you will deliver us because you're always faithful. You're good no matter what the outcome, God. And he paused and he stood there. And then Jehoshaphat did something really odd to me. <laughs> in my limited knowledge of warfare and all of that, that, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have made this call or thought about this, 
But what he did is next is he, he sends out the worship team onto the front lines. <laughs> and their weapons were their instruments. We got the tambourine lady. We got the acoustic guitarist going out there. You know, if it was me, I'd be sending out like Rambo or Rocky or Dwayne, Dwayne the Rock Johnson or somebody like that out to the front lines. But Jehoshaphat picks out like Chris Tomlin, uh, Phil Wickham, Carrie Job, the Gaithers coming out to the front line. All right, here we go to fight the battle. Right? It's a little bit odd. But this, the worshipers go out. And what do they do? They start praising God before they see the outcome. They start praising God before there was a victory. And by a miracle, what God does is so awesome. He takes those enemy forces, the three forces that came to attack the people of Judah, and instead they turn on each other and destroy themselves. There were dead bodies everywhere. There was so much pillage for God's people to take. It took them three days to get it all. They didn't praise only after they saw the victory, but they praised before the victory. It's easy to praise God after the victory, right? <laughs> Super easy. When all the anxiety is gone and we see the other side of things and we know what God was doing and how the outcome turned out. But it takes faith. It takes faith in the moment when you're hurting and stressed and anxious now. When you're feeling anxiety now, when you don't know what to do and you don't see a way out, it takes faith to praise before the blessing, before the anxiety is gone. I'm going to invite Jim up to play behind me as we reach the conclusion of this morning's message, I want to read to you what happened after Jehoshaphat prayed, paused, and praised prior to seeing the victory. God worked and he fought the battle. And scripture says this in verse 29 of 2 Chronicles 20. It says this, the fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. No longer battle on all sides. He had given him rest on all sides. So I've been sharing with you in the past couple of weeks how God has been doing a work in, in my life and or been sharing with you last week and this week and when I came back from sabbatical how God had been doing a work in my life spiritually setting me free from things healing me of trauma and mental health issues known and unknown different struggles that still exist there and and I can tell you that during especially over the past this past summer I've applied this pray pause and praise to my life I've pressed into my prayer life I've I've been raw honest with God. I've written out when I'm just quite not sure what to say. I write out and I journal my thoughts to Jesus. I practice pausing and being still. I practice praising God through worship and experiencing his glory through his creation and through his people because his glory is revealed through his people. His glory is in you as a reminder. And God has met with me in these moments. He's fought with me and God has fought for me. And I feel stronger with God than maybe I have in maybe my whole life, but for at least a while. And here's what I've experienced. Just like Jehoshaphat, God has given me rest. He's given me moments of rest on every side. He's calmed my anxieties. He's calmed my fears. I'm not perfect is not instant sometimes sometimes it's a process sometimes we have to call a friend to pray with us to stand in the gap but there through the practice of praying and pausing and praise i have felt his immense peace and rest in the midst of chaotic times so much sometimes and for me every once in a while there's a moment when i'll do this and it's instant and i'll feel his peace on every side but most of the time it's a bit of process for me and that's okay. I'm a work in progress. I'm growing in the practice of praying and pausing and praising. But this is how I'm choosing to fight my battles. I pray and I take it to God. 
When I don't know what to do, I pray, press into him and I fix my eyes. I some mock on him. I lean my whole weight on him. By nature, I told you, I'm a doer. I'm tempted to act and take control. But I'm getting better at waiting on the Lord. I pause and I sit in his presence and I give to him what I can't do. And I let him do it. I try. And I try to trust him with what I can and what he can do. And then I thank him. This is, this is a hard one sometimes, but I'm growing in it. I thank him, I worship him, I give him praise before seeing the outcome, having that faith, growing in faith that no matter what the outcome, he is good and he has good things in store for me. So no matter what, I praise him. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by him. So I fight my battles with God. Sometimes he fights my battles for me because our battle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood but it's against the rulers and the powers and the principalities and authorities of the dark world. And I know that I should never be afraid or discouraged because the battle isn't mine. It belongs to the Lord. It belongs to God. And so I'm getting better at giving it to him and trying not to battle it on my own. You, too, should not be discouraged. The battle is not yours. Whatever battle you're facing, whatever you're up against today, It is not yours. The Lord is with you. You need only to do three things. You need to pray. You need to pause. And you need to praise. As we wrap up this morning, I want to quote Philippians 4, 6 through 7 in full, the way it should be read. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, who will bring rest on every side. This is how we fight our battles. This is how you could choose to fight your battles this morning. It may look like you're surrounded and everything's pressing in around you. It might be a minor situation that you're facing this week, but leading up to it, you know, hey, now I can pray. I can pause. I can praise. And God's going to help me get through to the other side. Maybe you just live in that constant state of anxiety. And maybe you need to seek a little bit of health help from somebody else. But in the meantime, you can pray. You can seek God's guidance. You can pause. He could praise. This is how we fight our battles. We may look like we're surrounded, but God is all around us. This morning, I'd be willing to bet that more than likely anxiety is in your home. Maybe in your life, your spouse, your kids, maybe in in a workplace, maybe a close friend of yours. and, And you want God to bring healing. How about just right now? Anybody dealing with stress or anxiety in your life? You need God to bring healing? I see a few hands going up. I'm willing to bet there's a few more out there. Let's go ahead and pray that God would bring healing this morning. That God would help us fight our battles. That he would fight these battles for us. Father, we pray for pray today for so many who are facing battles big and small with anxiety. God, we ask for your help. We ask for you to fight for us and to fight with us. God, help us to be still and trust that you're fighting these battles, no matter the outcome, that you are good, God. Father, thank you that you are God who cares, who sees us, that knows us intimately, that knows the outcome, and that you love us and you seek and pursue our hearts, God. God, we pray that you would help us to know that you care and that we would that we would stop and pray that we would take our cares and burdens to you right now in this moment God we give those things to you right now in your seats just give whatever it is whatever you're holding on to you can clench your fists like in as a representation of what you're holding on to this morning and just release it open those hands up and just say God I'm giving everyone and everything to you, God. I give everyone and everything to you, God. I I can't control the outcome. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what to do. I feel the anxiety of the situation. But right now, God, I am choosing to pray, 
to release, to give it to you this morning. Help me fight my battles, Lord. And God, we, we pray and then we pause. And we ask that you would direct us, that you would speak to us, and that we would be willing to hear you and, and to listen to what you have for us. We pause. We ask for your healing. Whether it's instant or a journey, God, we just ask for the next steps, God, that whether it's healing that starts today or maybe something that is a process that we need to take steps towards, God, I pray that you would illuminate those, that you would make clear the path that we are to take. It's, God, start our journey towards healing today. Empower us to take the steps that we need. Direct us. God, we want the outcome to be all for your glory. We want the whole process to be for your glory, that we can be able to point to you, Jesus, for helping us overcome anxiety in our life. And then, God, we're going to praise you right now. We're going to thank you, God, for, for the victory that is yet to come, that we don't see because we believe, God, in the truth and your promise and who you are in your character, that you are good, that you care. And God, we believe that on the other side of this situation, on the other side of this battle, on the other side of this mountain, on the other side of this anxiety and stress, God, that there, there is victory. And today we thank you for being victorious in this situation. God, we thank you for bringing victory through the cross and through the resurrection of your son. We are so just overjoyed to worship a risen Savior, a victorious King this morning. And we praise you. We thank you for what you're going to do in each and every single situation that's represented here this morning. And God, I pray that as we move into this praying and pausing and praise, that God, you would bring us rest on every side, that we would experience the peace that comes when we put these things into practice and that we would just be able to rest in your presence as we pray and pause and praise. And we thank you for what you're going to do as a result from your message through the story, through a king who did these things, God. May we take it and apply it to our lives in our everyday situation. May we experience more rest in a world that's anxious right now. God, help us to bring our story into the light and to point people to you because you will be victorious. You are victorious. And so we thank you for that this morning. And I pray all these things. I lift up all of those that are here and watching online. God, I pray that you would go with them, that you would bless them, that you would bring them peace and rest this week. And it's in your mighty name and healing name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you feel it? Yeah. The rest of the Holy Spirit, God's promises are true. He will bring rest to you. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't be afraid to work through it with God. And be, be the family, be the church family. If you need help in it, we help each other. We help walk with one another. Seek the Lord, pray, pause, and praise. Well, if you want to stick around and pause some more this morning, you're welcome to just sit here in your seat and pause. You're welcome to come to the altar and just pray some more this morning. If you want to stay and Jim, he's playing some beautiful worship music here. You just want to worship and just praise the Lord. You're welcome to stay. Just want to remind you of our time of tithes and offerings as you leave this morning. Um, we just invite you to give in that way. And we want to invite you back next week as we're going to address another mental health subject. Um, I believe it's depression, although I didn't write it down. I believe it's depression. So we hope um, to see you back next week. Invite a friend to join you and feel free to just continue resting in the Lord's presence this morning or and go with God when you do. God bless. Have a wonderful week.